Good evening and welcome to the Exploratorium and tonight's presentation of Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight, Helium. This is one in a long series of talks that we're going to be giving over the next 10 years. Uh, last month we did hydrogen. Next month we'll be doing lithium, so we're going to work our way through the periodic table, at least at the present time, up to un un actium, element 118. So that'll take us a few years to get to that. Tonight, though, is helium. So I want to tell you a little bit about helium before we get to our other talks. Helium is the second element in the periodic table. We're all familiar with the periodic table. Here you see it on our screen right here. And helium is that element in the upper right-hand corner there. It's on the top of the inert gas uh, column. Helium is... Uh, uh, a really uh, very useful element to us. And it was discovered, actually, in an interesting way. It was discovered by the light it gives off. So atoms give off light when they're excited. So if you look at an atom, we have an atom here, and in the center you see the little blue nucleus, which contains protons and neutrons. In the case of helium, it's two protons, two neutrons, surrounded by a shell of electrons. And here we have one electron. I can excite that electron, say, by passing electricity through the gas. When, when I pass electricity through the gas, that electron jumped up into an excited state, and almost immediately that electron will jump back down into the hole that it left behind and give up a certain amount of energy, the same amount of energy that it emitted, uh, that it absorbed originally, and uh, <clears throat> that will give off a little photon of light. Now, you'll notice there are lots of shells here, and if you look at the number of jumps that are available to us, there's lots of different jumps you can make, a lot of different energy jumps. You could jump from the inner one to the outer one there, or you could jump Th that jump, that's a little less energy, so the first one might be violet, the next one, that's blue, and that jump might be yellow, and you can see there's all kinds of different jumps, orange and green and red, all kinds of different jumps that are possible here. So every atom, which has a, every atom has a unique set of these energy levels, will have a unique set of colors that it can give off. Helium, if you put it into a discharge tube and uh, lit it up, would give off a set of colors that look something like this. So on the left-hand side here, you see the helium tube. That's the color that it looks like to the naked eye, kind of white. And if you put up a diffraction grating or a prism, it would break that up into a series of colors. And here you see the series of colors is a violet and kind of a couple of blues and a turquoise and a yellow and a, and a red. Well, that yellow line there is the one that's actually really interesting because these two guys, uh, during the eclipse of 1868, used a spectroscope to look at the edge of the sun just as the moon was covering it over, and they discovered this curious yellow line that they had never seen before. They measured, they could figure out what the wavelength of that light was, and it was curious. And they had never seen that given off by anything here on Earth. Uh, if you did that yourself, it would look something like this, uh, and there you can see that yellow line. The red line is from hydrogen, and that yellow line is from helium, and then there's some green ones in there from magnesium and a couple more from hydrogen. But that yellow line never been seen before. And they, uh, therefore, felt that they had discovered a new element. And they named it after the Greek god of the sun, Helios, called it helium. And so helium was actually discovered on the sun way before it was discovered here on Earth. Um, here's a picture of the sun, just in visible light. Actually, if you look at the sun in different colors of different chemicals, you see different things. This is the sun that's just as seen in visible light. The entire visible spectrum it looks kind of yellowish white to us. If you look at it in the light of hydrogen, you see something completely different. This is the sun, by the way, on last October 23rd, and that giant sunspot group that was actually visible by the naked eye uh, was out there. That was really amazing. But if you looked at it in hydrogen light, you'd see something that looked like this. You see something different. You see the active regions of hydrogen and the places where it's, the hydrogen is cool. Or if you looked at it in calcium light, you would see something like this, something completely different. So it does tell you uh, a lot about uh, the sun just by looking at it in different colors. But that yellow hydrogen uh, helium line was what uh, cued them off. There was something different in the sun. It took a little while longer uh, for them to discover it on Earth. Uh, these guys here, well, I'm sorry, I don't have the picture of Nils. He's, uh, there's no picture of him. It's the anonymous picture. Uh, but uh, Sir William Ramsey was the person who was actually given the credit for the discovery of uh, helium on Earth. And by the way, I want you to notice uh, 
how well dressed he was to be in the lab. I have never seen any physicist dressed like that today. It's, it, today, physics just lacks a little bit of the class it had back in the 1800s. But he was looking at an element called, uh, a mineral called cleavite, which actually contains some radioactive elements. And he noticed that a mysterious gas was given off by that uh, rock. And that gas he uh, de determined was helium. So helium was being given off by this radioactive rock. Very interesting. So looking at helium, helium comes in a couple of different forms. The form I told you about, which had two protons and two neutrons, has an atomic mass of about four. And then there's another form of helium, an isotope, that has just one neutron, so two protons and one neutron, and that's called helium-3. Um, that's a very rare form of helium. As a matter of fact, if you look at the ratios, helium-4 is most of the helium uh, that you see, 99.99986%, and just a little bit left, a little bit of helium-3. Um, helium-3, again, very rare. If we it's so rare, it's really expensive too, by the way. If you looked at the cost, should we compare the cost to a few elements that we know and have, are familiar with? Like magnesium, for instance, about $4 a kilogram. If you, let's bring up something a little more expensive, little uh, titanium, about 10 times as expensive, $40 a kilogram. Well, how about something that's even more expensive like uh, silver? Silver is about $400 a kilogram or even more expensive than that. How about uh, enriched uranium? That's about 10 times that price, or about $4,000 per kilogram, or some expensive metal, uh, platinum. Platinum is about 10 times as expensive as that at $40,000 per kilogram, but we're still not up to helium-3. Helium-3, if you had a kilogram of it, would cost you about $4 million. This is a tank of helium-3 right here. Now, it's not a kilogram of helium. There's maybe a gram or so in there, maybe less, than, surely less than a gram in there. There's one liter of helium-3 in here, but that is probably the most expensive element you can find. It's made, you have to make it in reactors. It's actually made uh, outside the, in the, the uh, magnetic field of the Earth too, but on the Earth it has to be pretty much made in reactors. Or dismantling nuclear weapons, you, ha you can find it there too. But very rare element. So the helium atom, very small, very compact, it only has two electrons and they're both in that inner shell. It's only about one angstrom. What's an angstrom? An angstrom is uh, one, it's a uh, one with 10 zero, one over one with 10 zeros, a, a, a 10 billionth of a meter across. Well, that's kind of hard to, and the nucleus is even smaller than that, one femtometer across. Well, it's, that's kind of hard to imagine. Let's just look at it and let's blow it up. What if I had here a ping pong ball, a ping pong ball? just about an inch and a half across. And that ping pong ball, I don't have it here with me. Actually, it's in the, I do have it, but I don't have it on the stage here with me. That ping pong ball, let's put it inside the exploratorium. How big, if that was the nucleus of the helium atom, and I had it right here, how big would the atom be? Well, you might guess that because I have a picture taken from Google Earth that it might be pretty big. And actually, the helium atom would be about this big. So. If the nucleus was that big, the helium atom is much, much larger. Um, helium has a very low density. We all know that. We've, uh, that's why it floats. The density of air, it's about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Air actually does weigh something. If you've ever been hit in the face with a large balloon, you would know that. It's, it actually has some impact when it hits you. About a kilogram for a big, big balloon. Uh, the density of helium, only about uh, uh, a little, about a ninth that, uh, 0.17 kilograms per cubic meter. It's much lighter, it's uh, uh, density, it's much less dense. And so therefore, if you have a little bit of helium trapped, say, in a balloon, um, it floats on air, just like a cork, which is less dense than water, floats on water, while helium floats in air for the same reason. So uh, we'll see a little bit of that later. It is a, uh, exceptional in the fact that helium at atmospheric pressures is never a solid. It has no freezing point. However, it does have a melting point. Uh, I mean, it does have a boiling point, rather. And helium boils at a very low temperature. Here I just have three thermometers that are um, right next to each other so you can get an idea of the equivalence. We all know the centigrade thermometer, sorry, Celsius thermometer. 
I'm getting old, the Celsius thermometer and the Fahrenheit thermometer, well, we know water boils at 100 degrees cent uh, Celsius and 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's 373 degrees on the Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale is the absolute temperature scale where zero means zero. Where does helium boil? Helium boils way down here. Absolute zero is there, and helium boils about four degrees above absolute zero. That's pretty low. It's matter of fact, it never solidifies. You can't have solid helium. It's exceptional. It's the only element that, that never freezes. Um, it has some interesting properties when, it's, when you have liquid helium, by the way. Uh, you could actually have superfluid helium. Superfluid helium, which you're going to see here in this little movie, actually has no viscosity. You wouldn't feel it if you stirred it. It has, it's not like honey, you wouldn't feel it. It's super fluid. It uh, has an interesting property. It actually crawls up the, the walls of that little bowl there, that little dish, and crawls over. You can see it dripping from the bottom of that dish, and uh, eventually that dish will just empty itself out because of this super fluidity, this lack of viscosity. Helium makes up about 23% uh, of normal matter. Now I put quotes around normal because we're talking about matter that's uh, Baryonic matter, atoms and things like that in the universe. We don't know about dark matter. Dark matter makes up about 95% of the universe. But of the remaining 5%, helium makes up 23% of it. And most of the other 87% uh, uh, is uh, hydrogen. On the Earth, on the, even though it's 23% of normal matter in the universe, on the Earth, there's very little helium. In the atmosphere, it's only 5.2 parts per million. Compare that to actually the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is about 400 parts per million. There's very, very little helium in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, why is that? The helium atom at normal temperatures and pressures uh, is moving so fast that it bumbles its way to the top of the atmosphere and it's moving faster than escape velocity, faster than uh, seven, kilometer, seven miles per second. And so when it gets to the top of the atmosphere, zing, off into space it goes. So if you want to launch something into space, you just have to let go of a helium balloon and eventually it'll go up and it'll pop and all that helium will leak out into, into outer space. It'll stay inside the solar system, but it'll leak out into space. Now, if there's no, if we leak all the helium in our atmosphere, where does it come from, I hear you ask? Actually, it's being produced underground, and we'll get to that in just a moment. About 3,000 metric tons are produced inside the Earth every year, and that's produced by radioactive decay. Um, the, there are three kinds of radioactive decay. We're only concerned with one of them. There's alpha, there's beta, and there's gamma. The alpha decay, is when the nucleus emits an alpha particle. An alpha particle is, guess what? Two protons, two neutrons. That's a helium nucleus. So in alpha decay, all that uranium and thorium and stuff under the surface of the Earth is radioactively decaying into helium plus the daughter elements of uranium. Uh, the beta decay is when a nucleus emits an electron and gamma is when it emits a photon, but they, they don't really concern us. All we are really interested in is when the nucleus emits an alpha particle, which is really a helium nucleus, and some energy. So alpha decay um, gives you energy as well as the, the helium. As a matter of fact, if you're interested in the energy that it emits, you might take a look at this thing right here. This is a lump of something that is radioactive decaying to the point where it's actually glowing red hot. This is a lump of, this is a lump of plutonium. And this lot, red hot lump of plutonium is used to power things like spacecraft, where you need to get power out in space and you're too far away from the solar system, you're too far away from the sun to power with solar cells. This is how you power it. You have something that's hot, you surround it with uh, thermoelectric generators, and you can produce electricity. Uh, the Curiosity rover, now moving around the surface of Mars, produces its electricity with a thermoelectric uh, nuclear power generator. So, all of that uranium and thorium inside the uh, Earth is producing helium. So, inside the Earth is where it's coming from. So, where do we get it from? We get it as a product of gas extraction. It's mined. Helium is mined. I know that seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Brings together, it brings to, to mind that picture of miners in their 
hard hats and, and headlamps and they go down in the elevator in the morning and they come up all kind of sooty with high squeaky voices and after their shift, kind of like helium miners, but that's not how it happens. It's actually a product of gas extraction. This was actually discovered in 1903 in Kansas by this fellow Erasmus Howarth, Howarth, Howarth and he analyzed the gas coming out of the well and he discovered that it was about 72% nitrogen, some methane, some hydrogen, and about 12% of an unidentified gas. And that unidentified gas turned out to be uh, helium. So helium is then, actually you can store it underground this way too. If you find a geologic structure with an impenetrable dome, like they, where the gas actually sits, where they, uh, where they actually uh, uh, do the gas extraction, you can pump helium in there and store it in that kind of situation. And the storage facility in the US is, or, and is about to unbecome, uh, the cliffside storage facility in the panhandle of Texas. Uh, they actually pump uh, helium out of all these gas wells, they concentrate it and then send it to this facility to get be pumped back underground, and that's where they're storing it. Well, that's the national, the, the strategic helium reserve, which uh, the government has decided they don't want to be in the helium business anymore, so they're selling off the helium reserve, and this year is when they should be finished selling off our helium reserve. Here's that gas facility from uh, Google Earth. Um, and so I think that helium is gonna get a lot more expensive in the coming years. Uh, it has a lot of interesting applications. Of course, everyone's familiar with using it for balloons and airships because it tends to bob up to the top of the atmosphere, it floats. But uh, another cool use, and we do this here in our shop, is if you wanna weld things like aluminum or bron <coughs> bronze or things like that, you use it in something called TIG welding, tungsten inert gas welding. Uh, if you can't, if you, it's an arc welding, so you have an arc, but if you have the arc in air, uh, aluminum, you can't weld aluminum because the aluminum oxidizes, so you keep the aluminum in a stream of helium or argon maybe, an inert gas, and you can weld aluminum uh, using the inert gas uh, as a kind of a shield to keep it from oxidizing while it's super hot. Um, Another use that uh, I think everybody is familiar with is, of course, the MRI. So here's an MRI machine and a couple of results. That's actually me. That's my head. Um, so uh, you can actually uh, use an MRI to take pictures of the insides. You have very nice, high accuracy pictures of the, your internal organs. The um, MRI, however, has superconducting magnets. And to be superconducting, they have to be cooled to liquid helium temperatures. So the question is, do you want to use helium if it's this way and blow up balloons? and have party balloons, or do you want helium to look at your insides? Um, that's an interesting question because remember, it is a non-renewable resource. It's being generated inside the earth, but once it's gone, just like all the oil reserves, it's gone. It then drifts out into space. We cannot regenerate it. So uh, we should be preserving helium as best we can. Um, it's also used, by the way, to pressurize fuel tanks in rockets. Uh, you have this inert gas and it pressurizes the fuel tanks and pushes the fuel into the rocket engine. So that's another kind of important use for helium. You can use this stuff, this helium-3, to take super resolution MRI. Here's just an example of some lung MRIs taken with helium-3. Uh, helium-3 can also be used if it wasn't so expensive, could be used, at, or if we can increase its generation in uh, reactors, you could also use it as a fusion fuel. If instead of using hydrogen, if you use helium-3, you actually just get helium-4 as part of the reaction and a couple of hydrogen atoms off to the side and no excess neutrons. The neutrons in normal fusion tend to make the structure of a fusion reactor radioactive. So even though it's fusion, you will have, uh, you still have radioactive Con, uh, your, your, your containment structure becomes radioactive because of the neutrons, this would stop that from happening. Um, so that's about all I have to say right now. I'd like to uh, stop and we're going to bring up uh, our next guest. Thank you.